I want to welcome you to our uh, CNC Cookbook Feeds and Speeds webinar. I'm going to be going through and uh, discussing several different uh, things here. Basically, I want to follow this agenda. I'm going to start out introducing both CNC Cookbook and myself. I'm going to do a G-Wizard demo and cover some feeds and speeds concepts. And then I'm going to launch into uh, Q&A. So let's start out. Um, who are we? Well, CNC Cookbook is one of the largest CNC-related blogs on the Internet. And uh, that's just how I like to introduce us. So I'll, I'll give you some supporting information about that uh, in just a sec. But uh, we've been at, uh, at it selling our software for 10 years, and I've been blogging about CNC for 15 years. Uh, I also want to tell you a little bit about myself. I'm a lifelong CNCer and serial entrepreneur, and I'll give you a little bit more detail on that shortly. So here are some statistics for you that uh, give you some idea of our relative uh, traffic out in the CNC Internet world, if you will. Uh, we get a little over, well, actually a lot over 8 million visitors a year to cncookbook.com. Uh, for comparison, Mastercam gets about a million and a half. Haas gets five and a half million. Uh, the biggest online CNC-related forum I could find was Practical Machinist. They're bigger than CNC Zone. 21.2 million visitors a year there. The biggest professional CNC magazine that's online is MMS Online, 2.7 million-ish. And just for comparison, a big tooling company like Sandvik gets about 9 million a year. They're, they're pretty similar in size to CNC Cookbook. That's pretty crazy from my perspective. CNC Cookbook consists of myself and one part-time employee who's my son, Bobby, who processes the orders. I never would have guessed I could create a site that was so popular all by myself, and it's really kind of humbling. The truth is I didn't do it by myself. I did it with your help. Um, so much of our success is because of your continuing interest uh, and the many awesome ideas you give me for what to write about. As, as I'm fond of saying, um, I, I read every email that I get, and uh, so many of them have great ideas that I'm able to act on. Uh, let me give you a little bit more about uh, my background uh, here. Uh, so I'm a serial entrepreneur. You can find out more about that on uh, LinkedIn, and uh, feel free to, to check out my background. My biggest commercial success to date was a spreadsheet called Quattro Pro. So I've been at the business of creating uh, calculators, if you will, for a long time. I've uh, been involved in a couple of uh, acquisitions of my startups and one IPO. CNC Cookbook is my seventh startup company, and it'll be my last. I love what I'm doing here, and I, I don't really have any interest in doing anything else. It's, it's really the perfect uh, business for me. Uh, I helped invent what's called Agile and Scrum programming. It's basically, for those of you that know lean manufacturing, it's lean for programming. Um, I hold patents on various uh, user interface designs, including the spreadsheet notebook tabs you see in products like Excel. Uh, I'm an expert in machine learning and artificial intelligence. Two companies have used uh, AI algorithms. Uh, one I founded called Integrity QA Software. And G-Wizard also has some AI in it, and we'll take a look at that when we get to the demo. I'm an expert on SaaS and cloud. I've taken two, two companies into SaaS and cloud, and I consulted for Netflix and helped them uh, get their world up and running in the cloud. I'm a lifetime cnc -er and machinist. I consulted programming for the CAD companies of the day, Computer Vision and Intergraph, to name a couple, and that's how I paid for my college degree at Rice University in Houston. So been at CNC for quite a long time. And lastly, I'm a syndicated columnist for Cutting Tool Engineering Magazine. I make their CNC Chef videos. So that is a little bit about uh, who Bob Warfield is. As far as what CNC Cookbook does, other than sort of educating and writing interesting articles for CNCers, we sell utilities for CNCers. Uh, G-Wizard Calculator has over 15,000 users now. Uh, G-Wizard Editor, over 1,000 users. 
Uh, we resell MeshCam, which I like to refer to as the world's easiest cam software. We resell uh, Gearotic, uh, which is gear design, specialized CAD cam. It's actually a lot of fun uh, to play with. And we have a couple more products that are in beta test currently that you can, you can use for free uh, if you're a GWizard calculator user. Okay, so that's a, a quick background uh, about the company. I want to switch now over to our uh, GWizard demo and talk about GWizard and some feeds and speeds. So, okay, here we are. You should be looking at uh, GWizard now. And uh, familiar screen for many of you, I'm sure. Uh, this is the feeds and speeds calculator. I'm just going to kind of go through the tabs, give, give a quick run through of what's here. This is what we call CAD CAM Wizards. Uh, this is the artificial intelligence part of GWizard, and it's pretty slick, and I'll be showing that to you first. Uh, this is what I call my to-do wizard. This is how I manage all my personal time uh, with this wizard. I'm not going to demo most of these things, but I have a free uh, productivity course that you can take to learn how to be more productive day-to-day -day and use the to-do wizard. Uh, over on bobwarfield.com, which is my entrepreneurship blog. You know, we've got a, a scientific calculator. I think probably my favorite thing about it is the unit conversion uh, capability. I use that a lot. We've got a whole raft of uh, uh, geometry calculators that help with all sorts of shop math, sort of everything from, you know, trig calculators to bolt circles uh, to uh, true position for the geometric dimensioning and tolerancing crowd, polar coordinates, uh, Turner's cube calculator, uh, fits and tolerances, and a, a gauge block calculator for sign bars. Uh, you know, how many, which block should I stack to get a particular measurement, and, you know, what do I need to do to get a particular angle on the sign bar? So lots of good tools there. This is our thread calculator, which has just a, a, a raft of, of data on uh, thousands of different threads. You know, there's all these different thread families in here, Acme, BSW, all, all sorts of threads, uh, detailed uh, dimensional data on the threads, um, capabilities like uh, measurement over wires. There's even a manual lathe uh, recipe generator that will tell you exactly how to set up your lathe to cut uh, a particular thread on the lathe. So that's, that's pretty helpful. Lots of quick reference tools here. Everything from uh, drill and fastener uh, dimensions, uh, weights and volumes, thermal expansion, electrical calculations, including Ohm's law and resistor colors, motor sizing calculations for CNC, GNN code quick reference, hardness conversion, uh, rigidity calculator. That's pretty cool to give you an idea of what happens to your tool as you do things like change from high-speed steel to carbide or change the length or diameter. It's really fascinating how much of a difference uh, these things make. Uh, chatter calculator. I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Uh, GD&T quick reference. Uh, that links through to our GDNT course material. And you can even set up your own web pages of various kinds and access them here within GWizard. So that's very comprehensive. Uh, last but not least, we've got the Setup tab where you go to add different machine profiles uh, or configure your tool crib with all the different tools that you have available in your shop. So that's a quick overview of what's going on there. There's one more thing I want to mention, which is our uh, Getting Started Tours. Uh, click the Getting Started button, and there's a whole ton of these tours here. They take you through step-by-step step just about every feature in GWizard. So when you get ready to learn something new, click there and, and take the tour. They're all really short, quick, and easy, and they'll get you there in a hurry. Um, they also link through to the training videos, the, the beginner and pro examples, the user guide, and our help desk. So I think it would be pretty hard to find a product that's got more training and support than this one. Okay, so let's get into the meat of this uh, a little bit more. I want to do a demo. I want to give you a real-world uh, feeds and speeds demo. 
And as I, as I mentioned, I, I really love the CAD CAM Wizards. I always start here rather than in the Feeds and Speeds tab. Uh, when I'm doing my own uh, feeds and speeds calculation. And the reason is it gives awesome results, optimal results that are hard to get any other way. And it's, it's just super easy to use. Um, I got the idea for CAD CAM wizards talking to customers. Uh, you probably heard that old joke about whether a chicken is just an egg's way of uh, making another egg, right? That's the age old chicken and egg question. Well, Somehow, the way several of our customers' questions were going, it gave me the idea that the only point of a feeds and speeds calculator is to answer your CAM software's questions, right? I mean, giving the CAM software the best possible parameters before it generates the toolpath is, is really the whole point of feeds and speeds. And yet, traditional feeds and speeds calculators just seem so different than CAM software. And I think the reason for that is they came out of the world of manual machining. There's nothing wrong with that, but by taking a step back and sort of clean sheet of paper rethinking how this should work, we get something really cool that I call the CAD CAM wizard. So let's check them out. Across the uh, top here, and I always try to design the UI so you go left to right, top to bottom, uh, there's a couple of things we need to fill out. And uh, for this example, uh, we're going to do a, a CNC router. Uh, just let's take a, a simple uh, little router, a Shapeoko, for example, from our list of different machines. And you can, uh, you can machines come with GWizard predefined, and you can define machines really easily. There's five simple questions uh, that you need to go through to define a new machine. So we picked a Shapeoko, and while we're at it, let's cut some plywood because that's something the Shapeoko can do really well. Right, so we selected plywood off the materials. Now, the next thing you select is an operation, and these are CAM software style operations. You've got pocketing, and there's a little icon to show you, you know, a pocket. Uh, you could do a 2D profile, and here again, you've got this icon showing you you want to go around the outside. That's a 2D profile. Uh, you, you may be wanting to make a hole. Uh, do some 3D surfacing of some kind, uh, or do some face milling. These are all things that uh, are common in, in uh, CAM software, and that's where we start from here. So what I want to do with my shape oko and the plywood is I'm going to cut some shapes out of half-inch thick plywood. Okay, so great, let's start out. We're going to have to cut at least a half an inch deep, and in fact, Let's cut a little bit deeper. Let's add a tenth of an inch. So I just type plus 0.1 and hit enter, and you get a calculation right there in the field. And you can do that with pretty much any field you want. You can just type in the math, and it'll, it'll do the calculation. Um, minimum inside corner radius. Let's say we've got some inside corners on these outlines. Uh, stock allowance. Let's say we're going to try to leave a half an inch uh, uh, from the part that's as close as it gets to the edge of the plywood. Uh, and we are doing a part cutout, as I mentioned. Uh, we're not going to mess with chamfering. It'll automatically calculate a chamfer for you, but we're not, we're not going to worry about that since we're just cutting some plywood. And that's really all I've got to tell it. I hit recalc at that stage, and it comes back. And let me just resize this window. It's going to give me a complete roughing and finishing uh, solution here for my cut. Now, this is great from a lot of different standpoints. Um, first of all, if you're a beginner, you don't have to answer anything really technical at all in order to get a good feeds and speed solution. I mean, it even comes back and tells you what tool you should be using, you know, how many passes, cut depth on each pass, your RPMs, your feed rate, all of this good stuff is figured out for you, and uh, that's pretty slick. Uh, if you're an expert, what you need to know is we've optimized your cut depth and your cut width to give you the best material removal rates. And it, moreover, if we look down in this little DFM window, we consider almost 900 different scenarios, and this is where the AI comes in. Uh, it actually did some AI learning algorithms to figure out the optimum answer 
uh, and to choose which scenarios it should test. It didn't just randomly test 900 different combinations and pick the winner. Uh, it's actually really smart about how it picks them. Now, I don't know about you, but the last time I checked 900 scenarios before I did a cut was never. I mean, <laughs> who's got time to do that? But G Wizard did it in just a matter of seconds, and that's that's really pretty slick. So we've got a few other things going on here that are interesting. This is this is the DFM window at the bottom here, and, and DFM means design for manufacturing. So it will give you hints, if it finds any, on how to make the part more efficiently, or at the very least, It'll point out things that, that you're potentially doing that are making it really costly to make the part so that you can think about whether a change of design is warranted. That's pretty handy stuff to have, uh, particularly for the professionals. Um, so we've got our formulas here, our recipes as I call them, that tell us you know how to go about roughing and finishing. If I double click, now I am over in the regular world of feeds and speeds, the feeds and speeds calculator. As I say, I like to start out in CAD CAM Wizards and then use this part of the product uh, really to fine tune what's going on. Um, and that's pretty slick to be able to do that as well uh, because there may be some things that you want to change. Now, we have, we have one warning. The feed rate is maxed out. The shape OCO can only go so fast. And in fact, this uh, this feeds and speeds is capable of going a lot faster. So if I up this value to I don't know 400 inches a minute here, you see we get the little padlock and and boom, suddenly we're we're feeding a lot faster. But now we're hitting a, up against a horsepower limit. Um, so let's go ahead and take this up and make it a five horse spindle. Um, and you can see we kind of go back and forth a little bit, but G Wizard can let you override numbers in order to get values that work better for your situation. All right, now let's see what else we might uh, look at doing here. Um, for the beginners, I want to suggest a couple of things. First, you know, you probably picked your end mill kind of by trial and error. That's not optimized uh, as it would be with CAD CAM wizards. Experts know how to go about that. They know, for example, how many flutes to use and so on. But let's just let's just kick this thing over to a little heavier duty machine. Let's pick a Haas VF2, right? And let's go over to using uh, aluminum. Let's do some 6061 aluminum on this machine. And right away, we've got some issues. Now, it's telling us some useful things. It says let's use conventional instead of climb milling. It's telling us what coatings it thinks would be best if we want to use a coated. But it's also telling us, hey, you've got a four flute here in aluminum, and that's a bad thing. Um, so let's crank that down to three flutes, and that warning goes away. Um, we've still got some things maxed out, but it's also recommending coolant, mist, or lubricant for aluminum. So the tips are a pretty handy thing to have available. Um, looks like we're hitting an RPM limit. Let's go ahead and crank that up. Let's say we bought our high-speed spindle option or whatever. We're still going to hit it here, but we can go a little faster. And let's say we want to use high-speed machining. Well, you just click the high-speed machining button, and it tells us we can increase RPM. We're already locked out of that, and we can increase the feed rate. Pretty cool. Um, you set your cut depth and your cut width over here. Um, let's say we were having a uh, a problem with our... Uh, deflection, and I'll just set a great big stick out. That's a distance from the tip of the tool to the tool holder to create a deflection problem. And, and here we are, 590% of allowable deflection. Well, how do we fix that? Well, we can either reduce the cut width or the cut depth. If I just click cut depth, now I'm at 99%. Now, it's still red, but I can get away with this cut, right? And it calculated it in one click. It's a pretty shallow pass. But that's because my stick out is so high. If I bring my stick out back down to uh, what it was before, uh, that was a 0.85. Okay, now I got tons of room. I could go a lot deeper. Let's click it. I could go as much as 0.85 deep, which is actually that's probably deeper than I need to go. But we're hitting various limits, and so it doesn't it doesn't try to go deeper. 
And this would be a fine cut. I've optimized it in some sense. Um, the cut optimizer gives you a lot of different options. You can optimize the width while you lock the depth. You can optimize the depth while you lock the width. Or you can lock depth and width and just optimize feed rate. And what it's doing, again, is it's trying to minimize that tool deflection. We don't want our end mill bending like that illustration shows there to the extreme. One more thing I want to show you here uh, is the, uh, actually, I've got a couple more things, is the what I call the tortoise hair slider. And it takes you from aggressive roughing on down, right? We can back this off, whether to reduce deflection or, uh, you know, maybe, maybe uh, take things a little more conservatively if we don't have a very rigid setup, so on and so forth. As we take it down, we'll eventually get down into where it changes and it says, okay, now we're doing finishing, okay? So that, that lets us change the balance of uh, chip load versus RPM to get more of a finishing cut. And you see we hit into the red here at some point. That's because the deflection limit for finishing is much lower than for roughing. For roughing, all we're concerned about is tool life, but for finishing, we're concerned about also minimizing the tooling marks we leave in the wall of the cut. So we reduce the deflection allowance still further once we're in finishing. Now some of you may have heard of what's called rubbing. If you go too slowly, the tool starts to rub and you get problems. And if I go all the way down to the minimum, you know, full tortoise, I can get into uh, the, the minimum feed rate, the minimum chip load before I start to rub. And let me just show you a quick uh, look at what rubbing is. Uh, here's an illustration that I did in order to uh, make one of my uh, CNC Chef uh, videos for cutting tool engineering. And what you can see, these are two different cuts. The one on the top is a good cut. This is a super magnified view of the cutting edge. And uh, it's, it's able, you can see this yellow is the center line of the cut. It's able to get down below the surface enough that it can peel up that chip and break it off. Here's a cut that's rubbing. And the center line is way above the top of the cut. And what's happening is it's, all, it's pushing down. It's not slicing up. It's pushing down on the cut. So that's why we call it rubbing, because it kind of rubs and gouges its way along the top of the cut. And that's just, that's very bad. That generates a lot of friction. The friction generates a lot of heat. And ultimately what you find is it, it can be very bad for tool life. So we want to avoid rubbing. And uh, the good news is G-Wizard always gives you a nice warning uh, telling you that, hey, there's rubbing going on here. So, you know, knock that off. Um, let's look at a couple of other things um, that G-Wizard will do for you. So what I want to talk about is uh, what do we do about premium tooling, okay? G-Wizard is, is calibrated uh, for prototyping work. You don't, you, don't, you don't ever want to break a tool. You're only going to make one of the parts. And getting it done at absolutely the fastest feeds and speeds is just not that important. So things are pretty conservative. Uh, but if you spend money for a premium cutter and, uh, you know, you're looking for maximum production speeds, you want to crank up from there. You don't want to be that conservative. So, you know, let's say you buy a premium cutter. And I'm going to show you a, uh, a tooling table from a manufacturer's catalog. Here, let me just switch it over to that. Okay, here's a tooling uh, table that tells you the recommended feeds and speeds for a, a Lakeshore Carbide uh, end mill. I, I love these Lakeshore Carbide guys. Carl takes good care of you, and uh, their tooling is really good, and it's reasonably priced. Uh, and it's, you know, pretty high performance. And so like pretty much every catalog tooling table you'll ever see, it gives you ranges of numbers, right? If we want to cut aluminum, it's 200 to 2,000 SFM. And, you know, how do you know where in the range you want to go? 
uh, some some tables will either give you a uh, uh, a range on the chip load or inches per tooth, or they can give you these little rules, or they do both. Um, and they're saying here that well, for up to one times tool diameter, you use this inch per tooth. If you're slotting, uh, you, you cannot go deeper than half a tool diameter with this inch per tooth. Well, that's kind of limiting in how things are working, and it's you know forces you to make some judgments. It's easier just to let you wizard worry about that. So we've got two thousand, and for our quarter inch, we've got point oh oh three. So let's go back to G Wizard and have a look at how that works, right? So we're saying uh, we go to the manufacturer's area here. The our default's twelve hundred. Let's put in the largest number in the range because G Wizard will figure it out. 2,000, and let's take our chip load up to 0 0.003. Now, G-Wizard will automatically uh, keep track of where things need to be for you uh, relative to those numbers. That's why we enter the very largest numbers into G-Wizard. Uh, and, and, yeah, we've got some deflection problems and so on that we need to deal with, but what I'm saying is it's accepting these numbers, and for this particular cut, you know, for everything you tell it that's below the MFG line, it says, well, we're only going to go 570, and we're going to use 0 .0011 inches per tooth chip load, right? That's where it thinks you need to be in the ranges of the numbers based on this cut. And, you know, in fairness, we're cutting deeper than the one tool diameter that uh, Lakeshore is able to recommend with their table, and, and we're doing a full slot. And... That's pretty cool that you can do that and get good numbers, but it's a reason why you want to use a feeds and speeds calculator instead of simply relying on uh, the manufacturer's tables. Those tables are only two-dimensional, and unless they give you tons and tons of tables, it's really impossible for them to help you solve all of your different uh, feeds and speeds issues. Um, so that's why you need a calculator. Now, I'm not going to demo every single feature in here, but I do want to run through and just show you a few more things uh, so you know they're there and you can play with them if you get the free trial or you're a G-Wizard owner. Uh, first thing, the material database. Here are the basic materials, but you can also go into our full uh, material database, which has a lot more information, right? I mean, for aluminum, we've got all these alloys, conditions, and hardnesses. To, to just dial things in that much more accurately. Uh, we've got a history. Some of you only work on a few different materials, and so use the history. It's faster than tracking it down every time. Uh, we've got a search. If you can't figure out where to look for something, this comes up a lot in, like, plastics. Uh, you can adjust for hardness. If your particular material and condition isn't exactly in here but something's close, just enter a different hardness, and G-Wizard will uh, adapt itself to that. By the way, if you need a material added, just drop me an email. I add materials to this thing all the time based on customer uh, needs. Okay? Um, we we uh, have a really comprehensive set of different tools uh, we can handle. So you've got tool types. And, you know, everything from end mills to slitting saws and woodruff cutters and uh, lots of things in between, indexables as well, full geometry information, uh, full list of materials from, you know, high-speed steel to cobalt to carbide to PCD diamond tools, a uh, ton of different coatings. Uh, and the tip shapes are really important too. For example, you know, maybe you're running a serrated cutter or a corn cob, as people like to call them, instead of just a normal uh, end mill. You know, maybe you've got a ball nose uh, or a lollipop or you know, a, a chamfer tool, a corner rounder, tons of different tools. And we also cover the router-specific tooling, like down cut, uh, compression spirals, and straight flute cutters. So I think we have a bigger selection of different tooling types than uh, really anybody else out there. Um, so that's pretty cool. Let's talk about our families feature. This is another way to approach premium cutters. And the idea is, you know, first of all, we, we give you some that are predefined, like the uh, Lakeshore Carbides.
but you can create your own too. And rather than having to enter all those rows that you saw on the tooling tables, you just enter a couple. Enter what you need for a particular job, and GWizard can calculate between the lines for you. Uh, it'll let you uh, add more materials and and more examples, and it, it basically learns about that full range of cutters, so you don't have to type in so much. Um, HSM, we talked about it. Just click the button. Based on your uh, cut width, uh, uh, GWizard will figure out what's your tool engagement angle and what are the various adjustment factors to the feeds and speeds. By the way, this is another important reason to use CAD CAM wizards. Uh, when you're running HSM and in CAD CAM, uh, that's really um, a function of your, uh, uh, your roughing strategy. Uh, it really makes a huge difference uh, what cut width you choose. And a lot of the cut widths people are using are more about watching that tool fly around really fast than they are about maximizing material removal rates. You'll be surprised at what some of the combinations are that will work best for your job. Um, we have this crazy thing called the cheat sheet. It's another one that was a customer idea. Customers frequently were contacting me and going, I, I want X. What do I change in the feeds and speeds calculator to get? I want shorter cycle times. I want longer tool life. I want a better surface finish. Uh, I, I've hit the upper limit. I need slower RPMs. Or I've hit the lower limit. I need faster RPMs. What the cheat sheet does is it shows you things you can change to get yourself to faster RPMs. You can use a smaller diameter tool. Uh, bring on HSM tool paths. Go carbide instead of high-speed steel. And they're kind of, you know, really helpful things to have that give you ideas you might not have thought of for how to adjust your cuts. So that's the cheat sheet. We looked at the cut optimizer. Another, it's kind of a specialized uh, uh, calculator for deflection. Um, we have a whole line of specialized calculators. We call them mini calcs. And they're right down here. And they're like the Helix mini calc, for example, can adjust your, your feed rates in a Helix uh, based on the acceleration capabilities of your machine in order to generate much more accurate interpolated holes. You know, if you're, <coughs> excuse me, if you need to create a bearing pocket or some other really accurate bore uh, and you want to do that by interpolation and you're having trouble getting your machine to be accurate enough, this little calculator is really helpful. Um, there's a ramping calculator. There's a a plunge roughing calculator for these types of tool uh, paths that will get you better better feeds and speeds. Uh, my favorite is the vacuum fixture mini calculator. What it does is, uh, you know, based on what kind of a vacuum pump you're using and the vacuum it draws, uh, you give the part surface area and a safety factor, and it will adjust your uh, feeds and speeds so that the forces on the part won't pop the part off the table. Now, this is another idea promoted by a customer. He was, he was trialing G-Wizard, and he says, gee, Bob, G-Wizard is just giving me so much faster feeds and speeds. I can't use them, though. My parts keep flying off the, the vacuum table. Not all of them, but some of them. I said, okay, I, I can help you with that. I can help you with that. Um, if your machine has high pressure or through spindle coolant, or if you have a programmable coolant nozzle, G-Wizard will refigure your feeds and speeds to take advantage of that. Again, I think this is another one of those features where the only one's doing it. But, you know, you spent the money for those capabilities. Uh, you know, you need to get the benefit. Now, here is something that's been with G-Wizard a long time. It's really cool. And it's called our Cut Knowledge Base. I literally know shops who've made tens of millions of dollars by using the cut knowledge base to create a competitive advantage for their business. Now, what's that mean? How do you do that? What the deal is, is you can beat the feeds and speeds of any calculator. You just can't do it all the time. The trick is knowing when you can do it and how far above 
the calculator's recommended feeds and speeds, you can go before you reach the edge of the envelope and start breaking things. And that's different for every shop. It can be different for every machine, even in the same shop. Cutting knowledge bases are a way to figure that out and create a competitive advantage for your shop by letting you know what are the absolute fastest feeds and speeds for particular kinds of cuts. So you may start out with a G-Wizard calculated feed and speed, and you bump that up 10% and try it. And everything's good, so you decide you're going to enter it into G-Wizard. And, uh, yeah, it's pretty easy to do. You add it to the cut knowledge base, and it'll copy all the parameters in. But it, it, it asks you to rate certain things. How was your toolware? You know, was it normal or poor? Did you chip a tool? Did you break a tool? Uh, did you create chatter, and where was that on a scale of 1 to 5? Um, what comments do you have? So you put all that together, and, you know, which machine was it on? What kind of tool holder were you using? What did your coolant look like? And you save that, and then the next time you use G-Wizard, bring up the search, and it'll show you all of the cuts that are similar to the cut you're looking at now to give you an idea of how fast you can go. And I'm telling you, if you invest a little bit of time pushing the envelope, this turns into a huge competitive advantage for your shop to be able to do that. Let's see. i got a couple more things to show you, and then I'm going to open it up for questions. Uh, I want to show you our chatter calculator. So one of the things about uh, the cut knowledge base is you can map out where you've encountered chatter and what you did to get around it. And there's a whole science to that. I've got an article on the CNC cookbook that will walk you through it. But it is really helpful to be able to do that. But we also have our chatter calculator. So if you can actually see chatter marks in the wall of your work, let's say you see some and they're four thousandths apart. You're able to measure them, you know, optical comparator or whatever tool you use. But you can measure the separation of the chatter marks. And, you know, let's say you're going 1,200 SFM and some aluminum with a three-flute cutter. Now, we'll give you a nice table showing you what spindle RPMs will minimize that chatter frequency. So you can just dial that in. I mean, you know, 10,000 RPM, 6,600, there'll be something within the range of your machine. And if you dial that in, what you'll find is the chatter most of the time just goes away. Uh, because this takes away the vibrations that were creating the chatter in the first place. Really cool feature. Okay, almost done with the demo. Remember, send me those uh, questions. If you can't get them in on the chat or the uh, question section, and there should be a question section on your uh, webinar too, and I see there are a couple of questions here it looks like. Uh, just email them to me, and I'll I'll check my email as well. But we've got a we've got a uh, uh, tool crib here that you can use to manage the tools that you're using, and and call them up in the uh, feeds and speeds. Just select the crib, and then your tools will be listed right here. You know, here's a two flute that's meant for plastic from from Harvey. You just pull these tools in, and and uh, saves you a lot of keystrokes. So pretty slick. Okay, I am going to leave G-Wizard up here, and I'm going to go to uh, the questions, and we're going to see what we've got here. Okay. All right, Lisa wants to know, let's see, wait, sorry, Lisa, we'll get there. Okay, I see what's going on here. Let's see, where's our first question? Hello from Germany. Hi, Marcus. <laughs> All right, I, I, I didn't anticipate people would use the questions for the chat, and that's perfectly fine. I just need to get oriented to where the first question is. All is good. All right. I would have felt so much better if I had figured this out sooner. 
I don't do these webinars very often. It's been a couple of years, in fact, and I need to get to doing them much more often. Okay, almost there. And Lisa was first. Sorry, Lisa, I didn't get that sooner. She wants to know if you have a five-flute uh, carbide end mill for aluminum, how to adjust. Well, so there's a, there's a couple of ways, Lisa. Let me take this back to the generic no crib. And, uh, I mean, you can define that five-flute here just fine and we'll adjust for you. Uh, my guess is... Uh, that's an unusual end mill to be able to use five flutes in aluminum. So you want to make sure it is for aluminum. Uh, but assuming it is, and believe it or not, I have seen some odd end mills for aluminum that are high performance that have more than uh, three flutes. Just make sure the manufacturer recommends it. Uh, you're probably going to want to either create a family for those or enter your manufacturer's uh, surface speed and chip load. By the way, Anytime you define a tool here, you can take it to the crib with this button, right? So put it right in the crib as you create them. So if you think you're going to use a tool again, go ahead and start building your tool crib. Okay, let's see the next question. It says, when I choose optimize for depth or width, selecting rough or finish in a pop-up window always offers the same numbers. Is this normal? Um, it depends on what's going on. It, it shouldn't always, but of course always requires us to check a lot of parameters to make sure it's really happening always. Um, so it shouldn't do it always, but it may do it quite a lot. Okay, let's see. Lisa wants ceramic end mills, and that is on my to-do list. Um, so I'll take a look uh, at maybe bumping up the priority of that. Uh, Brett wants to know, how do I manage HSM? So again, uh, HSM is pretty automatic. It'll figure your tool engagement angle based on uh, your cut width. You do have the ability to tweak some things, though. Um, for example, here's a, a, a pop-up that will estimate what your uh, tool engagement angle is based on some things. You know, unless you're pretty advanced or you're, you know, trying to teach students what all of this means, I wouldn't mess with that too much. I just always let G-Wizard figure it out from the cut width and go with that. Uh, that seems to work pretty well. P wants to know if we're going to do this on iPhones or, or maybe Android. Pete, I'm sorry to say probably not. The, uh, I've had prototypes working, but the cost of it is is too high. I mean, Apple and Google want 30% of the revenue. People expect you to sell the app cheaper. There's just not a lot of good business incentive to do it. I'm sorry. I, I wish the uh, folks that own the platform were a little more generous about it, uh, sharing those rewards with the developers. Okay. Um, Rex is talking about burning up tools plunging into three or four stainless. Uh, he wants to suggest that uh, found he was using too steep a plunge angle. You know, and he wants me to put a warning for that in G-Wizard. And you know what? I think Rex is probably right. I think I probably should put a hint on that because stuff like stainless, you probably really should never plunge into it. You want a ramp or helix. It is so easy to chip a tool on entry uh, to those kinds of materials. And, you know, once the once the tool's chipped, you're going to have problems right away because, uh, I mean, the stuff is just nasty to cut through to, to begin with. So I, I think that's a good idea. I will add a, uh, a hint uh, that suggests not plunging in those materials. By the way, in general, the most gentle way to introduce a cutter to the cut is to helix or arc your way in. Uh, the next best is ramping, and, and plunging is always sort of the point of last resort. Uh, now, we tell you, by the way, uh, what kind of feed rate to use for each of these. You see Plunge wants to go 4.5, uh, Helix 15.9. Ramping, you can go even faster. Uh, it's not as gentle if you do, but it can get you into the cut faster and save you time. So 
you know, if you're not working with a nasty material, that might be the way to go if you're looking for the best possible times. Uh, plastics more in depth from Paul. He wants to show the plastics more in depth. Says we work with PVC, acrylic, and polycarbonate. You want to get used to using this more button here because the, the trick is, you know, we list out all the plastics in the more button, which makes it, I mean, here's polycarbonate, for example, uh, which makes it a lot easier to find what you're looking for. Uh, and you can also use the search. The thing is, we'll, we'll be adding more plastic materials, especially when we start talking about foam board and stuff, probably forever. I mean, there's so many different variations. So, again, you can request new materials be added. Um, Gabe wants to know, does G-Wizard apply to a Shop Saber 510 and 612? Sure. I mean, we can configure G-Wizard to really any machine. Uh, it's easy to create a new machine profile. Uh, these are the only questions you have to answer to create a new profile, and most of these are just picking a name for your profile. We didn't know the maximum spindle RPM, the minimum spindle RPM, you know, how many horsepower or kilowatts your spindle is, and the max feed rate. And that's really all G-Wizard needs to know. Uh, in order to start giving you good feeds and speeds. And you should be able to look those up for whatever machine you have. You should be able to, you know, find it in the website or in the owner's manual or perhaps by contacting the machine manufacturer, but it's almost always there. Uh, now, there are, there are some advanced parameters you can fill out, too, that can be very helpful. I mean, for example, we can, uh, we can provide you with a horsepower curve. Uh, we can... Uh, um, oh, just a sec. Yeah, here we go. We can set up a horsepower curve. Uh, we can weight adjust for small hobby machines. We'll derate your horsepower until you are getting rigidity equivalent to either a, a smaller VMC or a CNC router, which are typically less rigid than an industrial router. That's really pretty slick, although I think you'll you'll probably be surprised at really how little power you can use on these machines before they start to flex quite a bit. Um, a lot of this information is here also because we're trying to make this a complete reference uh, for all of our products. Um, so for example, the machine hourly rate is something our, our cost estimator uses. Tool changer slots and time is something editor uses to figure things out. So most of that you don't really need for G-Wizard. Okay, let's see. Gary says, I work primarily with wood. I use an Amana tool, a couple of numbers to surface side flat on a spoil board as well as, res oh, as, well as resurfacing spoil board. Couldn't come up with the information I needed. Um, wants to know if he should build a crib. You don't have to build a crib, although, you know, anytime I spend a lot of time creating uh, a tool, I tend to want to put it in a crib so I don't have to type it in again. Most uh, spoil board uh, tools are uh, indexable tools. Um, even if they have braised on, uh, braised on cutting edges that can't be changed, you want to still use the indexable setting. You know, tell it how many cutting edges it has, the diameter, all of this good stuff goes into it. And generally, we can go into the tooling catalog and look that up. I think I've got an email from you, Gary, and, I, and I've got a note to check that out. Um, so I will, uh, I will take a look at those cutters and send you a screenshot uh, that shows you how to set up for that. And I'm sorry I've been slow to respond to that. Lisa comes back and is talking about the diamond-like coating for HEM. Uh, again, uh, G-Wizard has uh, the ability to do PCD, both uh, end mills and... Uh, Drills. I just did an argument about uh, argument article about that uh, that walks you through it, and you can do that. The other thing is you can always just uh, you know configure it with the MFG numbers. You know, no matter what it is, if we don't already have it, you can make G Wizard uh, behave according to those numbers. Nick wants to know if we do high feed end mills. That is another one that's in the uh, to do list. It's coming pretty soon. I haven't got it yet. I've got a lot of number crunching that I do anytime I add a brand new tool type, so it takes a little while. 
Um, ah, Miles wants to see CAD CAM Wizards a little more, and in particular, how to do turning. So first thing to know about turning is you have to select uh, a CNC lathe. And let's, so let's get a Hostail 1 in there. And now pretty much everything changes, right? The tool menu, for example, is showing different tools uh, than it did for milling. Uh, same with CAD CAM Wizards. Uh, now we have, instead of pocketing, we have OD turning, ID turning, uh, facing, holes, grooves, threads. Uh, so you get a different uh, uh, look and feel. And this is kind of based on the conversational programming from uh, our uh, uh, GWizard editor. So, for example, on the OD turning, I can, I can crank a bunch of different diameters in here. I can, you know, have it radius or chamfer the corners, yada, 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 and, you know, tell it what kind of insert I'm using and all of that good stuff hit recalc, and it'll give me back a solution for that. Um, uh, Nick wants to go through the uh, helical interpolation uh, mini calculator, so let's play with that a little bit. Um, and we've got to get back out of having a lathe and back into having a mill. So let's get back to the highs. VF2. All right. And... Uh, Let's take a look here. I'm going to take the RPM and limit off and so on. So first thing is, you know, am I doing a hole or am I interpolating a boss that sticks up? Uh, let's do a hole. Second thing is, am I running uh, tool compensation or not? Uh, in other words, does the uh, 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 tool compensation show the actual edge of the interpolation? Or if, if not, I'm, I'm programming according to the, the center line of the tool. All right? Uh, and am I going to do a helical interpolation that's ramping down or just a circular interpolation where I'm going to do the whole thing in one shot without a ramp? Uh, I've got to enter my diameter. So that's pretty small, 375. Let's do a uh, two-inch diameter, right? Uh, and so given the way it's programmed, that means the actual toolpath diameter is 1.75 inches. My raw feed rate, which is taken from the other screen, and we didn't really set it up in the other screen, so you'd want to do that first, is here. No ramp. And it says I need to, just based on geometry alone, reduce my feed rate slightly. Now I've also got the option to base it on acceleration. And point 0.1 is in G's. And that's a pretty conservative acceleration for, you know, an older machine maybe. If you've got some really fast high acceleration machine with big servos on it and so on, you can do more. But the thing is, you really need to measure your effective acceleration if you're going to try to, to push the envelope. I would just stick with being conservative uh, and leave it at 0.1. Most machines can do 0.1. And in fact, what it's telling me is I don't need to adjust my acceleration, a two inch is uh, really a pretty big bore, and so I should be doing fine without adjusting it. And so I adjust for the geometry, but not the acceleration. Hit adjust, and it and it just bakes that feed rate in, and that's all there is to it. Uh, let's see. Wants to know: Is there a way to have a particular tool crib open by default? You know, I would have thought it would remember, but apparently it doesn't. So I'll add that to my to-do list for James. How do I run a faster speed without destroying my material? That's from Gabe. <coughs> Here again, I'd pull up the cheat sheet. Well, I'd start from CAD CAM Wizards and see what it says, because it's going to give me an optimal answer. But if I want to go faster still, I'd come over here, pull up the cheat sheet, and start looking at you know, what are the choices? And <laughs> sure enough, it says start with CAD CAM Wizard. Uh, you know, use an HSM toolpath, use better cutters and enter manufacturer's data. Try a serrated rougher. Uh, if you've got it, try through spindle or programmable coolant nozzle. Your machine has to have that. Uh, there's an ability to tell us you have a more rigid setup and uh, a horizontal machining center, for, for example, uh, probably should do that from the get-go, or 
make sure your tortoise hair is all the way to the right. Those are kind of what your choices are in this case. Okay, Bill Watson wants to know how to use the calculator to figure speeds for machining, drilling, and threading 360 half hard brass on a lathe. Here again, I, I think I would start with the CAD CAM wizards. I'd select a lathe. I'd go into the uh, brass section and I'd decide uh, which one of these brasses you feel like is, is closest to the brass you're, you're working with. I don't know, free cutting uh, brass, naval brass, uh, whatever it is. And I'd go from there. And you should, you should get some answers for these things pretty quickly. Let's see, running a compression bit in 0.727 ply plywood, and I keep snapping my expensive bit. Yeah, I hate when that happens. It looks like a really nice bit, too. It's an Amana with the uh, Spectra coating with John. John, the, my answer in these types of things is always the same. Send me a screenshot of the feeds and speeds you're running that are causing a problem, and I can comment on it from there. Uh, there's so many different settings that may be in play here uh, that I want to take a look at it. One of the things I worry about is, in this particular question, you've got a one-eighth inch bit, which is pretty small diameter to go almost three-quarters of an inch deep. Uh, a rule of thumb to think about here is don't go more than three to four diameters deep, or deflection is just going to be way out of hand. So, uh, and that's on a per pass basis. Um, so, John, send me your screenshot and I'll take a look. How do we edit a machine's parameters after we add a new machine? Well, you just go into setup, uh, bring up the machine, whatever it is. Let's say we wanted to change this VF2. And let's say, let's say we want to make it a VF2 with a, a 10K RPM spindle. I'm going to take the max spindle RPM up to 10,000. I'm going to click Save, right? And I'm going to come back here, and there should be somewhere in here a VF2 with a 10K RPM spindle. Interesting. I don't see it. I wonder if I've got a problem here. Oh, no, here it is right here, 10K RPM spindle. There's two VF2s. Okay, so that's how you do that. Why does the paste mill not let you choose high-speed steel or carbide? So, Paul, it's assuming the face mill itself is made out of high-speed steel, but that your inserts are carbide, basically what's going on there. I don't know if you have a solid carbide face mill or what, but they're typically so big in diameter, it's not really too worth it to worry about the material of it for deflection calculations. Uh, is there a way to save speeds and feeds outside of the tool crib? Um, not easily. In uh, GWizard Estimator, our cost estimation tool, you can export a bunch of feeds and speeds um, to a spreadsheet for your cost estimation purposes. There's not really a way to do that at present in GWizard, though. Um, oh, here's a classic question from Bill. I'm often asked to make aluminum parts that have deep pockets with corner radii that require small cutters. Tried lots of different cutters and tons of feeds and speeds combos. Chatter, chatter, chatter. Any suggestions? So... First of all, what you're doing is just plain hard, and it's going to be expensive because you can't do it very quickly. So let's start from that. But what you need to do on the chatter, the thing about chatter, and, I, and I'm going to refer you to our chatter article, just get on CNC Cookbook and use the search to find it. But chatter is a resonant phenomenon. And there's a particular frequency that the chatter is, is happening at. And the trick is to find the spindle RPM that minimizes vibration at that frequency. Uh, you can do it, and once you find it, the chatter is very predictable and very avoidable. And the article will tell you how to do that. 
But with that said, you know, what we both know is this is a very hard thing to do. Uh, okay, Rex wants me to put a prototrack length in. <coughs> Here's how I go about adding machine profiles. I basically look at what the most popular new machines users are adding are, and I try to get those added. And I add, I don't know, several machines per release. I'm currently thinking about speeding that up a bit, uh, but that's how they get in there. Um, Okay, question. Can you input GWizard settings into Fusion feeds and speeds, or does this have to be entered directly on the Fusion setups page? You should be able to enter what it, what it calculates directly into the feeds and speeds. Uh, here's a little tip. If you click RPM right here where it says RPM, it'll copy the RPM onto the clipboard. And if you click feed rate, it'll copy the feed rate, so that might make it a little quicker and faster. Um, Brad wants to know how to remove all the machines he doesn't have uh, so he doesn't have to look at them in selection. There's not a good way to do that currently. Uh, I need to add, really, I think a history list here below make. So I'll put that on my to-do list so it's easier for you to do that. Um, there may be some other things I can do to simplify that too, but I understand. Um, Gabe wants to know, he says, I'm running a single flute uh, carbide bit for aluminum and acrylic. Should I be using a different flute? So use a single flute for several reasons. Number one, because uh, it feeds more slowly than a, than a two or three flute or a four for that matter. And you're already going as fast as your machine will feed, so you want to keep that down. Number two, uh, some really gummy materials need the extra clearance to get rid of the chips. And, and usually it's cast aluminum where you have this problem, and it doesn't come up very often. Number three, really soft materials, and especially plastic, uh, are easily chipped by recutting chips, right? You're kicking these chips around with the cutter, and a single flute will blast those chips out of there and out of the way much faster, and so your plastic will come out with a better finish and less scratching. Okay? All right, so that is uh, that is our questions for today. Um, I wanted to, at the end of the uh, webinar here, just walk you through a promotion that we're doing uh, so that you can check that out. And basically, we're running a, a President's Day sale uh, this week and next. You know, there's offers posted all over the uh, the website, and uh, I'm sharing the the offer page here now. It's running for another 10 days, uh, but basically we've got uh, everything over $100 is marked down 15%, and everything over uh, $300 is marked down 20%. So good markdowns on these things. Uh, if you go to uh, the various pricing pages of the products. You know, here's our G Wizard editor. You can see that the three-year subscription is marked down to one eighteen ninety nine, uh, and lifetime's two twenty eight ninety nine. So, uh, trying to do a good thing here. Uh, be sure to check it out. Uh, it's not going to run forever. It's just going to run through the end of next week, and uh, it's a good chance for you to either renew your existing subscription or pick up a new product for your uh, arsenal. Uh, let's see, Julian wants to know if the video will be available. It says here that it's been recording my video, so I need to take a look at the video and make sure it's all good. Um, but uh, uh, I should be able to, to get that recording up, and I will send everyone that subscribed to the webinar a link to see the recording. Okay, I'll stay on here a few more minutes to answer uh, uh, more questions. Um, for those that have them, I see I've got one more at least. Uh, Thomas wants to know how to set up uh, the cutting conditions. So let's go back to G Wizard here for Helix, and uh, just uh, just set it up as you as you basically normally would uh, for whatever you're doing. So let me get a reasonable end mill in here. I want to. Do a, just a basic carbide end mill, three flute, 
right. Okay, so we got a three flute carbide, quarter inch end mill, and cut depth. So how far down does it go in one revolution of your helix? And uh, I don't know, you can make a worst case assumption of uh, it's going to go a full diameter. And when it first starts out, it's going to be full width, right? So that's how I would set up uh, that cut. Now, I'm getting deflection warnings and so on here, and of course you don't want to have that. Let me just reduce the stick out. Right, everything's now happy, and so I would then go into Helix, as I showed you before, and go ahead and make these adjustments. Um, Brad wants to know about torque. People like to know about torque. It's shown down here in this right column. Uh, just make sure you're looking at it for the right reasons. This is not a good way to design a machine and size your motors because what you'll find if you go through the calculations is uh, a machine that's powerful enough for most of the different tool forces is going to be a pretty anemic machine because it takes most of the force to accelerate the machine table or the spindle for a router, uh, not to offset cutting forces. Um, what's the correct coding for the amount of spectra? I don't have a good coding for that, that type of, uh, I think they're called nano coatings. So what you're going to want to do is just use the, just set whatever coding you want and override with uh, these manufacturer numbers like we showed you how to do. Do you have a tapered 15 degree ball nose? Uh, yeah, you can set up a taper angle on your ball noses, right? You do that uh, right down here. Okay. Wants to know about driving an end mill into a corner whose radius is only a bit larger. Yeah, um, G-Wizard will deal with that. Um, generating a G-code, well, you can get some of that out of the conversational wizards in uh, um, G-Wizard Editor. Um, so take a look at that. I need to do a webinar around Editor as well. Gabe, uh, send me some email because I need to end the uh, webinar at this point. Uh, so send me some email. And then those of you who I didn't get to your questions, also uh, send me email. I'm happy to respond, and we'll try to help you out. Uh, I want to thank everyone for attending the webinar, and uh, we'll try to do another one soon.